good afternoon and good evening and welcome to the last PowerPoint presentation for Biology 1021. You have finally made it. What a long, arduous road, but you've made it to the final PowerPoint. And this one here, we've saved the best for last. This is the introduction to your first organ system, the skin. My name is Ian Coates. Welcome to it. Next week, your last exam. Any questions, let me know. Functions of the skin. Serves as a mechanical barrier. Protects internal structures. Participates in the immune response. Acts as a gland for vitamin D synthesis. Performs excretory functions. Performs sensory roles. Body temperature regulation via sweat glands activation and vasodilation or vasoconstriction of dermal blood vessels slows down water loss by diffusion. Skin does a lot. Absolutely important. Organ definition. Body structure is composed of two or more different tissues that perform specific function. So that is what an organ does. And if you had any doubt that the integumentary, integumentary system was an organ, look at all of it does. An organ system, all it has to do is have two different functions. This has many. The skin, the cutaneous membrane, and its accessory organs, hair, nails, glands, and sensory receptors, make up the integumentary system which acts as a barrier between the internal environment and the external. Largest organ makes up about 16% of the total body mass and covers about 1.5 to 2 square meters. The skin has three main layers. Really it has two, but I call it three. These are the two layers here. Most uh, don't include the subcutaneous layer as part of the skin, but we all teach it together anyway. So you'll see there the very top layer, the outermost layer is called the epidermis. Okay, that is stratified squamous epithelium. Underneath that you have the dermis, which is a thicker inner layer of connective tissue, blood vessels, smooth muscle, and nervous tissue. Basement membrane separates the epidermis from the dermis and anchors these layers together. Underneath the dermis is what we call the hypodermis, or called the subcutaneous layer, sometimes called sub-Q. Layer underneath the dermis consisting of areolar and adipose tissue. Binds skin to the underlying tissues, but is not part of the skin per se. Adipose tissue insulates to conserve body heat, contains major blood vessels that supply the skin. So these two here are the real skin. This is not, but we teach it all together anyway. You'll see there the layers of the skin and the hypodermis. Okay, there's your epidermis on top smaller layer all dead pretty much except for the um, first uh, couple layers but the majority of it is dare is dead and keratinized waterproof and no blood minor phagocytes in there but it's really nothing much going on you get down into the dermis though now you're talking you've got small blood vessels you've got um, uh, glands there for secretion. You even see the hair follicle. You see the epidermis dips down, so the hair follicle is technically still in the epidermis, but the epidermis dips down well into the dermis. Okay, uh, you'll see sebaceous glands there that provide oil there for the hair, blood vessels. Uh, for every hair in your skin, there's a little muscle there. Okay, it's called the erecte pile muscle. And when this contracts, you now have goosebumps. All right, erecte pile muscle is involved in goosebumps. All right, 
And then below there, you'll see the adipose tissue there of the sub-Q layer, okay? Major blood vessels, fat tissue in there. And if you had any doubt, hair most certainly is alive. You can see the blood vessels entering and leaving the base of the hair follicle, okay? There's your epidermis on top, okay? These are the type of cells there that we're going to be talking about. We introduced those there last in last week's class in tissue, okay? Characteristics of the epidermis, okay? Uh, there is thick and thin skin. The entire body has four layers of the epidermis. On the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, though, there is an extra layer of skin. And on... The, those areas there, we, uh, we term that as thick skin, all right? So, the uh, epidermis here, there are the five layers, and you'll see there that the four layers in black type, those are for the thin skin, okay, where hair is allowed to grow out of. But you'll notice there that when we add the fifth layer, this stratum lucidum, this now constitutes what thick skin is. And there's no hair on the palms of the hands or soles of the feet because of this layer here. So starting from the uh, basement, okay, the basement membrane there where, uh, the, uh, where all these cells germinate, okay, it's called the stratum base cell. Okay, and it's just above there the dermis. And these cells here are germinated, and they're big and fat and alive. And as new cells come up underneath them, these ones here, they get pushed up into the next layer, the stratum spinosum. And then, this, uh, and then you get into the stratum granulosum. Something else is happening here. And on thin skin, there is no stratum lucidum. The next layer would be stratum corneum, but on thick skin there, they do have that fifth layer, stratum lucidum, okay, which stops hair growing, all right? And then the outermost layer is what we call the stratum corneum. We'll get into all these different layers there as we go, okay? Just a nice shot in all of its totality, okay? So the epidermis there of the thick skin, you'll see that here is the uh, the epidermis okay your stratum corneum your stratum lucidum granulosum spinosum and then your stratum base cell down here so this is your epidermis and then down here you have the dermis okay and you'll see these invaginations there and this is done on purpose for the whole point there that your dermis and epidermis don't fly off when you move your arms around the room. And you'll see it's all about creating surface area and attachment so that the dermis is very much attached to the epidermis and the epidermis doesn't go flying off. Okay. And funny enough, this is what causes our fingerprints is these what we call these dermal papillae. They are unique to all individuals, and it hooks our dermis onto our epidermis. And in the meanwhile, provides us with fingerprints. Okay? So, the stratum base cell, starting at the bottom, okay, is the deepest layer, single layer of cuboidal dividing cells. It is well nourished by dermal blood vessels connects epidermis to the dermis via intertwining collagen fibers, okay? Dermal papillae are finger-like projections that come up from the dermis into the base cell to make stronger connections between the dermis and epidermis, okay? Something there called a Meisner corpuscle involved in light touch. You'll see it right here, okay? The whole idea there that how... You, if you put your fingers onto the desk, you can feel that you're touching the desk, right? But you don't have any nerve endings there. You don't have any. So how do you feel anything if you don't have any nerves there? Interesting, correct, right? We'll get there. We'll get there. So 
Um, a base cell cell continually divides mitosis, and in that process there, new cells are formed, and these cells get pushed up. So it's all about mitosis, okay? Um, and as these cells get pushed up, okay, they get keratinized, and they get harder, okay, as they get pushed up. And this process there is called keratinization. And if we just go back here, you'll see there that you know, these uh, keratinocytes start to appear here in the stratum spinosum. And then as these cells get pushed up, they become drier and dead, and they become hardened, which is what our outer skin should be like. It creates a waterproof barrier against bugs. Okay. Uh, we have melanocytes there, Merkel cells there as well. Okay. Uh, good. Merkel cells, these are receptors responsible for stimulating sensory nerves that the brain perceives as touch. Okay. So when you feel, you're not really feeling anything. You're feeling the pressure of your epidermis pushing on these Merkel cells. So you're not really feeling anything. We are perceiving touching. Interesting. Okay. Melanocytes there, these produce pigment and they give hair and skin its color and helps protect melanin. Uh, melanin there, the living cells of the epidermis there from UV radiation. All people have the same number of melanocytes. Okay. So there's your melanocytes, Merkel cell, there's your stratum base cell. Okay. And moving on up, stratum spinosum. Just an, uh, another shot here of these melanocytes here. They're kind of like octopus. They're stretching out in between, okay, the, uh, the cells there. Perfect. They provide color, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, just another shot here. There's an electron micrograph there of these melanocytes alongside the cartoon, okay, and it stretches up. It's there right on the uh, basement membrane protein there separating the dermis from the epidermis. Okay. The stratum spinosum. Okay, that's this layer here right up from the stratum base cell. Shiny in appearance, composed of 8 to 10 layers of keratinocytes formed from the results of cell division in the stratum base cell, which is continually pushing up these cells there to the next level. Interspersed in this layer and this layer are dendritic cells, okay, phagocytic if bacteria get in, okay, uh, macrophage there which engulfs bacteria, form particles and damaged cells. Here the keratinocytes begin producing keratin and a waterproofing glycoliquid, okay, and uh, the continued mitotic divisions of the stratum base cell keep pushing up, okay. Good, there's a link right there, and you can have a look. Okay, seems to be taking its time there. Maybe my internet's out. But anyway, you guys have a look at it, and keep me posted if there's any issues, okay? Um, moving on up, stratum granulosum, okay, these guys here tend to be grainier, flatter, thicker cell membrane, because further changes to the keratinocytes are coming there from the stratum spinosum, okay, Gener generating large amounts of keratin, okay, and keratohyalin, okay, here we start to experience cell death, apoptosis, right, Nuclei and cell organelles, they begin to disintegrate, leaving behind basically like an empty corn husk, an empty shell, a dry, there's nothing living anymore. That's what's going on here. The stratum lucidum, this is for the thick skin, okay? And densely packed there with eledin there, clear pro protein rich in lipids derived from keratohyalin, okay? Gives the transparent appearance typical there of the soles of the feet and palms of the hand. Prevents hair from growing out of these areas specifically. Okay. 
And the top layer there, we're now into the stratum corneum, the most superficial layer of the epidermis. Okay, increased ca ca uh, keratinization, 15 to 30 layers, help prevent penetration of microbes, dehydration, and mechanical protection, uh, mechanical uh, protection, like if you hit your arm or elbow or something like that. Sheds periodically, about every four weeks, we get new skin on top. You can reduce this time by doing a cosmetic procedure called microdermabrasion, which removes some of the dry, dead skin. Hi, sorry for that there. My uh, wife called me there. Uh, the uh, Got to answer the phone there. So the, yeah, cosmetic uh, procedure there, we can, you can make your skin look younger. You can rejuvenate, uh, rejuvenate your skin by removing those upper dead layers and you'll get there to the younger looking skin underneath. Microdermabrasion. Don't know a lot about it. Maybe I should. <laughs> uh, epidermis recap. Knowing all the different layers there, your five layers when you're talking thick skin, know what's happening there, the whole idea, Merkel cell, melanocyte, there's your dermis on, underneath, perfect. Uh, there's all the different layers there, just kind of uh, magnified and the blue, you'll see your stratum lucidum there, that's your uh, the fifth layer for the thick skin, very, very thin, but you'll see there, even just look at your own uh, palm of your hand and how the skin is very different than everywhere else. And then look at the skin there on your back, as opposed to the skin on your forehead. Very thin on your forehead, very thick on your back. Um, the moles, okay, they can range from benign, okay, to different kinds of uh, uh, melanomas here. Generally, how when moles go like a, a healthy mole, will be completely round, okay, uh, because it's growing in all directions. It tends to mean it's a healthier mole. If you're getting moles here that are growing in one direction and they're not, you see how this mole here is, sh uh, the width is shorter than the length here, that tends to indicate that there might be trouble, okay. Uh, dermis, now we're into the underlying areas here. There's a lot more going on than there was in the epidermis. Okay, you'll see those dermal papillae, those finger-like projections that go up from the dermis into the epidermis there. It's all about creating more surface area and making sure that your epidermis doesn't fly off and hit the wall when you move your arms or something there. So, you'll have a look here. There is a lot. There's your dermis, like you're talking sweat glands, your hair follicles, uh, capillaries, um, all these. Uh, Recte pile muscle, sebaceous glands. We'll get there. So, these dermal papillae here, these collagen fibers, you'll see them in here, extend upwards there towards the epidermis from the reticular layer. Uh, these are responsible there for your fingerprints. Uh, they provide a toughness and elasticity to the, to the skin. Uh, they contain fibroblasts, microphages, adipocytes, blood vessels, nerve fibers, sensory receptors, hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands. This is all contained within the dermis itself, okay? Uh, the tissue there that lies beneath the skin, not considered part of the skin. Here we're into the hypodermis. And this is this section down in here. Okay, what we call the subcutaneous layer. And if you're a little bit of nursing lingo, um, generally, you know, injections there, they tend to be sub-Q. So the needle goes all the way through the epidermis, all the way through the dermis, and the needle empties its contents down into this area in here, okay? Because this is where the major blood vessels are, all right? And that's where the medicine is going to get taken away, right? Uh, it's highly vascularized, okay? Good for injections, right? Insulates the body from extreme temperature changes. Connective tissue, okay? Anchors the skin to the underlying structure, all right? And when you think of burns... 
like uh, first degree burn, second degree burn, third degree burn. Think of it as layers in here, right? Because basically, a fourth, you know, a third degree burn is worse than a first degree burn because basically you've burned off all these layers. And if you burned off your skin, now you have you're a sitting duck for bacteria. Because as it stands right now, as you are sitting there watching this video, me sitting here creating this video, we're co completely covered in bacteria. You can't get rid of them. They're always around us. They're always on us. You know, I have bacteria that's good for me. You have bacteria that's good for you that was given to you by your mom. Mine was given to be by my mom. And, but the problem is, you don't want these bacteria getting inside to the good stuff. Okay, that's why uh, any of our holes, and we have lots of them uh, that are already predetermined, nose, eyes, ears, mouth, it's all mucus producing. Because mucus, is it's a continually produced uh, resource there that's on its way out. So if bacteria get in, well the mucus is on its way out, so it'll carry that bacteria with it. But if you don't have any skin, man, this is all warm, moist, and dark, beautiful places there for bacteria to get in and love. So we'll get into first, second, uh, third degree burns there later on. Uh, skin, drugs, and chemicals. Please know that whatever you put on your skin within a couple of minutes, that will now be in your bloodstream. Your skin is highly porous to creams and chemicals and these kinds of things. So please be careful. Uh, nicotine patches. This is nicotine that's uh, on a patch. You put it on your skin and the nicotine makes its way into the bloodstream. Okay, transdermal patches, intradermal injections, topical applications, hypodermic injections, lots of different ways for drug delivery. Okay. Um, the skin tells the story here, reflects disease processes of the body, drug reactions reflected in the skin. The skin responds, responds to chronic irritation. The skin mirrors your stress level. So if you have healthy skin, if you're a healthy individual, your skin will look healthy. Okay? And, uh, you know, red blotches on the skin, that could be indicative there of an allergic reaction. Skin rashes. Something is going on. If the skin isn't happy, it will let you know. And there's hives, urticaria. Okay. Um, if the skin is uh, becomes irritated, and you keep using that particular skin to do an activity, you'll develop a callus, which is a thickened area. And this is where the skin uh, gets thicker because it's getting worn down at a higher rate. Okay. Accessory structures of the skin. Okay, here we've got the uh, nail plate. Okay, the most actively uh, mitotic region of the nail here is what we call the lanula. And if you remember, just going back, 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 right here, right? The whole idea there that there's your basement. Okay, all the nutrients comes from here because all the blood vessels are down here. There isn't any blood vessels up here, right? So everything gets fed from here. New cells keep getting uh, pushed in underneath. The older cells go up, right? And eventually there these cells keratinize and die. Well, what do you, the, it's exactly the same process for the hair and the nails. Okay, so skin, hair, and nails is kind of all one and the same. Okay, where these new cells here, you know, are, are, uh, are grown. And then new ones underneath, pushing the older ones up. And as the older ones move up there, they become keratinized and hard and die, right? That's how it all goes. So um, it consists of a nail plate overlying a layer of skin uh, surface there called the nail bed, the lanula, half moon shaped structure there at the base of the nail plate. This is the most actively mitotically growing region right in there. Okay. Uh, as new cells are produced, older ones are pushed outwards and become keratinized. Okay. Um, yeah, this just uh, shows you here what's going on and see how far the nail goes down in. Okay. And you'll see there that uh, this is where the cells begin, but then they make their way 
out. And then they die as they get older. Okay, just some more shots there of the nail itself. Okay, the nail body. Okay, the nail root. Three edge there. Or if you don't have any of these, if you're like me, you bite your nails. Uh, hair follicle. I love this there. Electron micrograph there of an actual hair follicle. And you see how dry the skin is. And you see how dry the hair is. And again, the hair is alive at the bottom. There's a blood supply there right at the base of the hair. It's alive, but then new hair uh, uh, cells are made, pushing the older ones up. These guys here get keratinized, and they die as well. Uh, hair can be found in nearly all regions of the skin, except the palms, soles, lips, nipples, and portions of the external genitalia. Each hair develops from epithelial cells at the base of a tube-like depression called the hair follicle, which dips down into the dermis. Okay, So this is basically the epidermis dips down all the way into the dermis. We'll show you there in another slide. Uh, the deepest part of the hair root is called the hair bulb, located at the base of the follicle. And as new cells are formed in the bulb, old cells are pushed up outward and become keratinized and die forming the hair shaft. Okay? Dead keratinized epithelial cells. Yep, there's that one there. And yeah, a good little movie there. Way too much detail. Okay, but it shows you there all the bits and pieces of what's going on. And you see there the epidermis comes down. Okay? All right, and there's your blood supply coming in. Okay, so the hair is alive, it just dies on its way up. Okay, you have sebaceous glands there that provide oil there to keep it all nice and oiled and uh, lubed up. You've got the erecta pili muscle there that is attached to the hair shaft there in times of stress or cold or something like that. That will flex and boing. There's your goosebump. Another shot there, electron micrograph besides a cartoon. I always find these important to have a look at and compare. Okay. Another shot. Okay, keratinized cells of the hair shaft, keratinized cells there of the epidermis. Okay, see how dry it tends to be? And that's all these the newfangled shampoos and conditioners there. Keep it all oily and nice, right? Hair color is determined by genetics, okay? We introduced their genetics there, uh, was it uh, the week or a couple of weeks ago? Week 10, I guess it was there. And um, melanin is produced there by the, remember the melanocytes there, those octopus-shaped uh, cells there, okay? Uh, responsible there for most hair color. Um, eumelin, okay? Dark hair contains this, which provides their uh, brownish-blackish color while blonde or reddish hair contains pheomelin, okay, more reddish and yellow, okay. Eumelin, brownish black, pheomelin, reddish, okay, and yellowish there. Albinism, condition there, no pigment at all, okay, where the individual there is white, the colors of the eyes tend to be uh, reddish, okay. A uh, mixture of pigment and unpigmented hair is gray hair, okay? The erecta pili muscle, we've spoken about that one there. Androgenic alopecia. Androgenic is male. Alopecia is hair loss, male pattern baldness. And there's your alopecia, hair loss anywhere, which can affect men or women, okay? Uh, just some more words here, some terminology, melanoma, skin cancer there from the epithelial cells. And you remember there, uh, you think maybe this will change your idea of skin cancer. What is that, slide 39? Going back to, yeah, any one of these ones right here, right? Like this is so actively mitotically growing. These new cells here, every four weeks, you know, we get new cells on top, Right. And uh, all of there's a complete regeneration after four weeks. So these are always dividing. And now you go out into the sun, UV, you know, when you're, uh, you, you know what cancer is now. The whole idea there that these are always actively mitotically dividing. DNA is being doubled here rapidly all the time. 
And if you're exposing this there to massive amounts of UV, like sunlight, there the chances there for skin cancer will increase dramatically. So you just want to take care, wear that suntan lotion. Uh, where was that there? Right here. Um, there's albinism, disorder affects the coloring of the skin, hairs and eyes, vitiligo, some melanocytes lose the ability there to produce melanin, uh, liver disease, cancer can turn the skin yellow, uh, tumors of the pituitary gland, okay, can result in darkening of the skin, Addison's disease, characteristic of bronze color, uh, if you eat a ton of carrots every day, your skin will go orange due to carotene. Uh, cyanosis, when your lips turn blue because you're cold or low oxygen, okay? That's called cyanosis. Now, some of these slides here you will have seen there before, okay? Uh, the whole idea, merocrine gland, apocrine gland, and a holocrine gland, okay? Um, when you, when I, th we, we saw this there last week there, but specifically there with the hair follicle, okay? This is how... Um, this uh, sebum there is released, okay, where the whole cell just kind of falls off, sloughs off, and then disintegrates, okay. This is associated there with the hair follicle, the shaft of it, okay. Uh, merocrine glands and eccrine glands here, that's these two, okay, uh, where the secretions exit via exocytosis. That's this one here where the chemical is just released via exocytosis, and then you have the uh, apocrine gland where, um, and these ones here, it, it's, there's a bit of a smell associated, okay? Eccrine glands here, it's mostly water, okay? Forehead is an easy one, neck and back as well. You tend to sweat when you get nervous, right? But it, the sweat on your forehead doesn't smell. These apocrine glands here, okay? These ones here become active at puberty. They respond to fear, emotional upset, pain, sexual arousal, uh, most numerous in the armpits and genitalia. And this sweat here isn't, it's watery, but this sweat here also contains proteins and fats that are, um, uh, that can succumb to bacterial decomposition. And that's where the smell comes from, okay? Uh, those are apocrine glands there, all right? where part of the cell just kind of disintegrates off. While these ones here, his, uh, the uh, holocrine glands, the entire cell just falls off. And merocrine, these ones here, this gets released via exocytosis, okay? And you'll notice there that these are all exocrine. Exocrine, they have a, they have a duct. Endocrine, no. Um, just nice shot here, isolating here. The, there's your uh, apocrine gland, your merocrine gland there, okay? In here, apocrine gland, okay? And then there's your sebaceous gland there associated, okay, with the hair follicle itself, okay? And there's your, uh, the, the hair follicle and there at the base there you see uh, a good, sub, uh, good blood supply for sure, okay? Body temperature regulation, when we're talking about the skin, absolutely. The whole idea there that if you get hot, okay, your blood vessels will then get bigger. That's called vasodilation, and they will go closer to the skin. And if that blood, hot blood, is traveling closer to the skin, it'll be, it'll be able to release some heat as well. Um, then your body will start to sweat, Okay, water has a very, very high heat capacity, and as long as the body can get rid of some of the hot water, it'll take the heat with it, right? So uh, there's your uh, things to note there. There's your core temperature. That's the inner part of your body. And then you have your shell temperature, which is the surface area, which can be quite different depending upon the environment, right? Uh, thermal regulation, balance of heat production, and heat loss, Okay. Um, by the way, if you didn't know, the majority of your heat comes from skeletal muscle, okay? Um, that's, we're hot-blooded because of our muscles for sure. The, uh, some more words here that you will have to carry with you throughout your medical career starting now. 
There's a no, uh, normal thermia. Normal. You have fever, which is also called pyrexia. Okay, where we have now gone beyond the hypothalamic set point. Okay, your thermostat there. Okay, then vasoconstriction there to conserve heat and shivering there to produce heat causes the body temperature to reach an elevated set point there. Okay, fever. Uh, there's hyperthermia and hypothermia where we've gone below. We have we're cold here. We are hot. Okay, we have an inability of the body to get rid of excess heat. Okay, and there are different levels here. There's heat stroke and uh, yes, and uh, the it's very dangerous here if you ever uh, if the skin starts to feel prickly. Okay and the skin starts to feel sticky, that's when you know you're, you're, you're in a bit of trouble and you need to get into the shade and get some water there. Hypothermia there, um, this is where the body will start to induce shivering, okay, uh, to make you move in order to get that body temperature up. Uh, yeah, there's your heat production there, metabolism, basis of body temperature, blood disperses heat throughout the body, most heat is produced by the muscles, the liver and the endocrine glands affected by food consumption, hormones, disease, and physical activity. If you try and explain to my 10-year-old daughter that when she is so hot and the only thing that will cool her down is an ice cream, that actually, in fact, that ice cream will make her hotter, she will not believe me. But think about it. It does. That ice cream doesn't, in fact, cool you down. Heat loss. Skin, 80% for sure. Lungs and excretory products, absolutely. Uh, types of heat loss, radiation through our head, conduction, touching, convection, and evaporation. Okay. Uh, temperature regulation here, we're talking about the hypothalamus. Okay. Which you'll get more into there when we get into uh, bio uh, 1022, the nervous system. But the whole idea here that the heat loss there, and you can see, and then the heat conserved. If you're too cold, the body will make you shiver. The blood vessels will constrict, meaning that the blood vessels will dig down into the core to get away to conserve heat. You won't sweat, okay? But heat loss there, dilation of blood vessels, sweating. And it's all controlled by the hypothalamus, right? If you are starting to sweat, a message will go to the hypothalamus saying, hey, we're at 38.5 degrees. The hypothalamus will check its set point, 37 degrees. Whoa, we're heating up. So then the hypothalamus will force the body to get cooler. Okay, it's all about this set point. Okay, and then if we start to cool down, a message will be sent. Hypothalamus will again check its set point and make a comparison and adjust as needed okay healing of wounds all right here we're talking about inflammation if you have uh, if your skin if you have an inflamed area you know it's uh there's a, some swelling it's red it's irritated well what does that mean it just means that there's more cells there than there should normally be and that's why it's all red and swollen okay uh you maybe you've got a cut You've got an infection, something is going on there. There's a reason why there's more cells than normal. And, you know, it's there's more cells there and they're pressing on the nerves there, so that's why it's more tender than normal. And there's redness, heat, swelling, and pain. These are all the causes there. Redness, vasodilation, more blood in the area, heat, large amounts of blood accumulating in the area. Uh, increased metabolic activity, swelling, more cells there than there should be, pain, more cells pressing on the neurons, right? Uh, the healing of a deep wound, okay, this, um, I don't know if you're familiar with something called hemostasis, okay, the whole idea there of an artery or uh, a blood vessel being cut and what happens there, the whole idea that um, uh, when an artery is cut, the, the two cut ends as a result, what happens, they spasm, 
all right, which will temporarily stop blood from leaving those arteries. It gives you know a uh, you know uh, you know seconds to a minute before this thing will start to really start to bleed, right? And that gives the body time to get helper cells there, you know, platelet cells, coagulating cells, fibrinogen there to try and stop the bleeding. Um, so this is when you're talking about the healing of a deep wound here, the response to a deep injury extending into the dermis or the subcutaneous layer, because that's where the blood vessels are, okay? There's no, blood, there's no blood vessels there in the epidermis, so it's, you know, it's not a bad one. But when you start getting down into the dermis and sub-Q, that's where the blood tends to be, right? And uh, so a blood clot and dried tissue fluids there, they will form a scab to cover the wound, right? Fibroblasts migrate to the area, secrete collagen fibers and bind the edges of the wound together. Phagocytic cells remove debris and dead cells. Damaged tissue is replaced and the scab eventually sloughs off, okay? Um, the extensive collagen fiber production in the area may, for an elevated area, uh, produce a scar. This is uh, large wounds will tend to leave scars, and healing may be accompanied there by the formation of these rounded masses called granulations. A uh, new branch of blood vessels grow in the area. The vessels accompanied by a cluster of, uh, cluster of fibroblasts that begin producing collagen fibers, and eventually the blood vessels are reabsorbed fibroblast leave and ultimately leaving a scar and you'll see here there that um, you know here's a b c and d and you'll see the uh, you know it's not, nothing too crazy here there's your wound for whatever reason okay and uh, it's down and it's bleeding right and then all of a sudden there the blood starts coming out but you know because of the platelets and the fibrinogen there um, and you know uh, they start to plug the hole eventually. And then you get the macrophages there, the Pac-Man, chomp, 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 fibroblasts there, white blood cells there, just cleaning up all the mess, okay? And they start from the down, and they work their way up, right? And they're cleaning it all up. Everything is regenerating. Blood vessels there that weren't there, that were destroyed, are now being regrown, okay? And eventually some scar tissue, scab, and there you go, okay? Um, this is an interesting one, okay? Uh, and uh, in your medical career, I'm sure that you will experience this, uh, you know, in a hospital setting there, uh, and uh, if you ever get a chance to work on a burn unit, it's just more experience, right? And you'll see here that it's called the rule of nines, and uh, if someone's, you know, a uh, paramedic is calling in, we've got a burn victim here, and they're going to ask what percentage. Well, this is a quick, easy way to identify how bad the burn is, okay? And it's called the rule of nines, where um, the we're just looking anteriorly here, and this is posterior, right? So the chest, 18%, the front, and the back there, so there's 36%. Okay, so if that amount of skin is gone, that's 18%. Uh, the front of the leg, the front of the leg here is 9 and the back is 9 and 9. Okay, the arm, front and back is 9, 4 and a half and 4 and a half. Same on this side here, total 9%, 4 and a half, 4 and a half. And then the head is a total of 9%, 4 and a half for the front, 4 and a half there for the back. So it's all based off of 9s. And uh, because, as we said, if the skin has been removed in any capacity, now this person is a sitting duck for infection, okay? And uh, that's why they have a whole unit at the hospital titled the burn unit, okay? Uh, and there are the four stages of wound care, okay? Um, as related to here, okay? And you guys can have a read of that. Uh, the most serious wound type is a stage 4 wound there, which will likely contain some slough and be deep down in the skin. So when you're talking about wounds here, okay, the, the severity, it's all based on, you know, how deep it goes down. Because if you, you know, uh, stage 1 there where the skin isn't broken but maybe slightly red, so like a scrape, okay, 
Uh, stage two, where the wound is open and or broken. This may look like a blister that's ruptured. Okay, now what happens there? Uh, the epidermis. We get down into the dermis. Okay, and uh, look at the, the fat portion of the skin. And, uh, you know, what's below, and then you get into the hypodermis. Okay, that's where the major blood vessels are. That's where the fat is. Okay, that's where the muscle is. So, um, and the whole idea that a first degree burn, second degree burn, third degree burn, like a third degree burn, you're pretty much burned all the way down to the bone. Okay, the, the muscle there, and the muscle won't grow back. These, it, it, it's, a, it's a tough one there, but it's a, interesting there to see and to work with and to have that experience with. Um, there's your burns there, categorized based on the layer of skin that is damaged. Superficially affects there the epidermis. Partial thickness affects the dermis, and full thickness there affects the cutaneous layer. Okay, there's a superficial, partial yeah okay yep clinical application here psoriasis is a chronic skin disorder characterized by a more rapid division and movement of keratinocytes through the epidermal strata all right and uh cell shed there to seven to ten days as flaky silvery scales abnormal keratin produced okay uh, skin grafts here where they can take new skin, uh, which uh, cannot regenerate if the stratum base cell and the stem cells are destroyed, right? If there's no stratum base cell, no more skin. So what they do is what's called an autograft, covering of wound with a piece of healthy skin from a self, okay, from somewhere else. Uh, isograft is from a twin, okay, uh, transplantation of patient's skin, after it has grown in culture, okay, autologous skin. Take your skin, grow it in a culture, put it back on you, okay. Isograft there is from a twin, autograft to taking a piece of skin from you and putting it on you. Interesting, eh? Well, I hope that you guys really enjoyed this course. Uh, Biology 1022 will, uh, will actually be even better. Uh, the macrobiology is, is, honestly, it's a lot more fun than this microbiology. But you're almost there. You've just finished the last PowerPoint there. Now you've got some questions there to look at. Have a review. Have some fun. Okay. And uh, just do your best. And we'll see you there for the test coming next week. Okay. If you have any questions, get a hold of me. Take care. Talk to you soon.